Never piss off a rich redneck. This is a story about my grandparents' friend. I was a young teen, but given the outcome, this story has stuck with me. I've sat on this story for a while, but it's so satisfying to see a gaggle of Karens taken down a notch that I figured I'd share. For the sake of this story, we will call my grandparents' friend William. Now, my grandparents knew William from way back. My grandmother knew him from school and my grandfather met him after marrying my grandmother. Anyways, in the 60s grandma was a manager at the 7-Eleven. William led a crew that went there every day. It was the only gas station in a 30-minute radius so everyone knew everyone in that sleepy coastal town kind of way. Now, one day William was doing a job down on the waterfront and slipped, fell, and broke his back. While he was healing from the operation and was broke as a joke, my grandma would always make sure send him something to eat that she'd pay for when the crew would come in to grab their snacks and gas up, knowing William would simply skip the meal to save the money for his own family. My grandpa also took him to several doctor appointments since William couldn't drive for a while and his tiny little wife couldn't wrangle him into a car by herself. William never forgot that. 20 years later when he sold off his now very successful business and was a millionaire about 20 times over, he promptly told 90% of the world to go to hell but kept those that had always been there for him close. Meanwhile, he never moved from the house that he did since before he was rich, his only concessions to his wealth were trips with his wife to see the world and buying up quite a few acres of the forested land around him. If you weren't his friend, you'd take him for every other blue-collar worker in the town. There was absolutely nothing obvious to show that he was worth tens of millions of dollars. After his wife died in the 90s, William decided to take up a new hobby. As he lived outside of the city limits, he set up a sawmill and woodworking shop, got all the proper permits and everything. The saws were in a big old enclosed building in the middle of all that land so in all honesty so no harm no foul, right? Wrong. The family that owned the forest behind William's land had just sold it to developers. Thus, the new luxury-gated neighborhood the first in the area was born. Enter a plethora of chads and Karens who were mostly from up north and had moved down south to take advantage of the better weather in the nearby beach. It didn't take long before they decided to take offense to his little business venture on the other side of the 10-foot tall wall of their neighborhood because it didn't fit with the image of their community. You know, the community he was decidedly not a part of. So, they sued him didn't even try to start a dialogue with him, just up and sued him. William. Was. Livid. He was your typical coastal redneck and he would be damned if those damn Yankees told him what to do on his own property that was not within city limits nor located in Anhoa. William countered with professional noise studies that showed that some of the kids in that neighborhood drove vehicles that made more ambient noise than his little operation. Nope. The people in the neighborhood simply threw more money at the lawyers to continue on with the lawsuit. Essentially, their plan was to bleed him dry. Their lawyers, who were not locals, actually told William's lawyer that he should probably advise his client to close the shop so that he wouldn't end up bankrupt due to the resources being thrown at him from the homeowners. Due to the relatively modest surroundings of his home, the neighbors nor their lawyers had any idea the man was actually richer than just about all of them put together. All they saw was an older dude who drove a beat-up 80s model truck and wore Dickies jeans and work shirts that lived in what appeared to be a relatively modest home, especially compared to their McMansions. When William's lawyer told him about that conversation, William lost his ducking mind. I clearly remember his screeching into my parents' driveway in that old work truck, cussing up a storm and ranting and raving before he even got in the house. He came to our house why? Because my grandmother, bless her heart, was known as one of the most giving people in the world, unless you pieced her off. If you hurt her or someone she cared for, she became one of the most vindictive shoals that could be found in that town. I am not kidding when I say that her ability for revenge served cold was legendary amongst the locals. So William had come to the house for a dose of her deviousness. Us kids weren't allowed inside during that conversation, but after he left that day, I later heard the adults talking about how he proceeded to hire quite a few private investigators to see if there would be any dirt to dig up on them. By them, I mean the dozens of people in that neighborhood that were a part of that lawsuit. 
Lo and behold, there was apparently copious amounts of dirt to be had. I still remember him positively crowing about it to my grandparents one fine summer day months later. That 60-something-year-old man was as gleeful as the proverbial kid on Christmas morning. Why? Because after he learned what his little private army dug up, he started making some phone calls to various acquaintances in high places. The ensuing fallout meant that the lawsuit was dropped. There was quite a list of misdeeds that were discovered, but the ones that I heard talked about by the adults that stick out are, there were more than a handful of individuals that owed back child support. William very helpfully had the private investigators provide the mother's updated address and employment information so that they could pursue said child support garnishment if they wanted to. On top of that, the IRS became very interested in several of those people as well as various other neighbors. Finally, one household ended up in prison because the investigators realized that they were drug dealers, the pictures of the transactions caught by the pies were helpfully handed over to the sheriff's department drugs are bad, kids, moral of the story, never PSS off a rich redneck. Redditor's reaction story 2 after, Redditor 1, he should have bought some of the houses in the HOA and then used the collective voting power of those households to vote himself onto the board. Enforce the rules on those suing him so that they have to pay in lots of fines to the point that they can't afford it, put liens on their houses, then after destroying their credit and live some, disband the HOA and sell off the houses to those less fortunate to bring down the value of the homes in the neighborhood. In addition to what actually happened. When they realized that it was all because of their petty lawsuit happy behavior, it'll be obvious to them that they done goofed something serious. Story 2, they jumped the guy while on a date and put him in the hospital for weeks. He and his friends later set the same situation up and did it to them even worse. To preface, my dad told me this one and I wanted to share it here. He grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. Just across the Red River is Bossier City, Louisiana. My grandfather worked with the father of the original guy who got jumped in this story and told him and my dad about it. It was 1970 and the guys involved were in their early 20s. Oh, I have nothing against rednecks, people would even consider me one before calling me a hippie. They just happened to be the bad guys here. There was a popular drive-in in Bossier. There was also a group of rednecks who'd run anyone off from there they didn't want there. Hippies were a big target. Police didn't ever do anything. They weren't known for being untrustworthy at this time. Also, one cop was the father of one of these rednecks. The hippie who got jumped thought it'd be safe to take his date on a Saturday afternoon. Not long after pulling in in his van, a truck parked behind him blocking them in. They dragged him out and beat him badly and told him to never come back. He ended up in the hospital with broken bones and bad bruising for several weeks. His girlfriend told their friend group, which consisted of a lot of other hippies, what had happened. When he started getting better they started talking payback. When he was out of the hospital he took his girlfriend back to the drive and in his same van, hoping they'd show back up. They did. They parked behind him again to block him in. Walking from the truck to his van they were hollering how they told him not to come back and since he did it was gonna be worse this time. What they didn't expect was the side door to open and more than 10 hippies that had piled in there to get out with baseball bats and metal pipes. They proceeded to beat on these rednecks, a real beating. None of them died, but they did all end up in the hospital with far worse injuries than the original guy. He learned that some of the injuries ranged from broken noses, broken ribs, severe head injuries, internal bleeding. They really got him. As satisfying as the revenge aspect is, I found just as satisfying that the hippies didn't get in any trouble since the rednecks who started it and had been doing it to others too, didn't get in any trouble. Also just as satisfying is the rednecks didn't ever mess with anyone at that drive-in again after that. Redditor's reactions. Redditor 1, make love, not war, but if someone else decides to show up with their own batch of war you'd be rude not to partake. Redditor 2, a clown car full of hippies wielding baseball bats and metal pipes. A truly scary sight to behold. Op answer, I hate clowns with a passion. When I was a kid, the movie Clown House came out. It gave me nightmares. They're supposed to be nice. You expect hippies to be nice. I imagine had I seen a bunch of hippies get out of the van with no context, then beat some guys, 
I'd probably s it myself every time I saw one from then on. Maybe s it myself every time I see a flower or something. That'd suck. Redditor 3, wage war in the name of love, not hate. That's what these hippies did. Really satisfying this happened. Redditor 4, hey there kinfolk. I'm in Shreveport boss here. Raised in plain dealing, op answer, howdy. You just jogged a memory. What's the name of the, I want to say it was a catfish restaurant instead of seafood but could be wrong, that either was or still is in plain dealing? I know it was there during the early mid 90s. My great grandfather took me there. I remember it being really good. Redditor 5, I'm trying to imagine their faces when they just saw all of them with the baseball bats and whatnot. 